Okay, welcome back. Today we're going to look at the First World War Part 2. This is the road to war. And the uh, rail car here with the gentleman on there, they are not looking exactly scared, run down, or afraid. And this is definitely a German train on the road to Paris. And I'm sure they think they're on the way to Paris, and that's the plan, but we'll see if that's successful here. Um, most people didn't have the chance to take the train, but the voyage and the journey uh, across Europe for war, even though Germany's right next door, they kind of take a detour. And that's what we'll talk about here today and try to fill you in on how the strategy of this war ends up setting the stage for four years of battle, unlike the world has ever seen before. So what aspects of 19th century history contributed to the First World War? I think that you have to keep in mind that what we've just studied in the previous chapter with imperialism, uh, colonialism before that, and the rise of these massive worldwide empires like Great Britain, who became the United Kingdom. We've got um, the French with a pretty serious empire, the scramble for Africa, Previously and before that, all of the struggle to get uh, to Asia and get those um, uh, the riches that the Asian world would supply to Europe. And of course, just before that, as we studied at the very beginning of this semester, uh, the American world and pulling in all of those raw materials. And so there is this great competitive spirit in Europe that uh, propels them forward with things like the Industrial Revolution and before that the Age of Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution. These are very good things in terms of producing uh, at a high level but it also has created a situation where the success of some has made uh, others quite a bit jealous and wanting what Great Britain certainly has. So historical rivalry, rivalries are uh, sharpening, and Italy and Germany are joining into these fragmented territories uh, that they used to make up into uh, single nation states. And that's an important thing to consider and keep in mind. And, you know, in World War I, the, the Germans are fighting often with many different uniforms, different colors, uh, different insignias and flags because there, uh, there are many different kind of smaller principalities that are coming together to form uh, the, the German army. German unification occurred in the context of the short war with uh, France and Franco-Prussian War and it created bitter relations between these two uh, and we'll see that continue for the rest of this, uh, this unit for sure. The rapidly industrializing Germany is wanting its place in the sun. And as Wilhelm II said, their emperor, he said, we have fought for a place in the sun and have won it. It will be my business to see that we retain this peace in the sun unchallenged so that the rays of that sun may exert a fructifying influence upon our foreign trade and traffic. That is what this is all about. Germany wants an imperial uh, presence. They want to have the kind of resources and power that uh, the, the British have. And so that's, that's where we're at with that. And certainly Russia does and Austria, Hungary does as well. There is this push for um, you know, that world power type of situation. So the unique situation of Europeans' pride, self-confidence, and se sense of superiority, which we have already discussed with uh, things like social Darwinism, are coupling together, uh, but few could have imagined if you were looking at it in terms of just that present time period and what was happening with uh, China kind of uh, failing in many ways in the in the East, the Gr Great Britain rising, um, and all this incredible transformation happening in Europe. N not many people could um, for foresee that a half a century later, things would not only unravel. Uh, in Europe, but basically be left in ashes. So what we're going to see happen here is this nationalism and system of alliances that are going to kind of fall into place to create uh, 
the climate for war to occur. And during the 1900s, we have several crises erupting, and many of them have a racial racial content or racial um, uh, undertone to it. Hard for some of us to to get through our heads, and maybe not for me. I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, where there are many Eastern and Western European um, nationalities that are represented in in that city in that that area in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and here in Texas and in Houston especially, we, we're so multicultural that sometimes we see uh, whites or uh, people of European descent and think, well, they're just they're just white. Um, when you're in Europe, you can sense and see those differences dramatically between what we think are the white people of Europe. They don't look at it that way. Even within their own countries, there are sometimes ethnic and uh, racial divisions. And race is just... A social construct. It's something that we as humans have created to divide others and to relate uh, ourselves and our tribe to. And this spins out of control in Europe. So the Slavic state, the Balkans, have a dream of creating their own nation state, much like Germany and Italy have done. Um, Austria-Hungary and in their empire, the Austro-Hungarian empire, um, swallows up much of this territory during expansion, and they have been battling the Ottomans below them, you know, uh, down in the Middle East. So there's, they're kind of caught in the middle between two pretty powerful empires: one on the rise, Austria, Hung- Austria, Hungary, and one on the decline, which is the Ottomans. In fact, we'll see later. We'll discuss this a little bit, but Serbia actually defeats the Ottomans to gain their independence, but. Austria-Hungary is growing in, in force. The result is that the Balkans, or this area called the Yugoslavian territory, or they call themselves Yugoslavs, which is southern Slavs, is boiling. It's building pressure. And these in- increased tensions in Europe result in you know, the major European powers, or rising powers, to try to keep that boiling lid on the pot. So Great Britain, you see there, that's John Bull with the top hat. And you can kind of think of it this way, Great Britain's on top, and that's the top hat. Russia is here, the man with the beard. And remember, this is not the Russians of the Soviet Union yet. This is uh, uh, pre-Russian Revolution, so this is the time of the Tsars, or the White Army, as they'll become. The French here, with kind of the bellhop hat, is is how I refer to it. Mais à tic au bague sur, you know. Uh, they they kind of look like that in, in a way. Uh, of course, Germany in the middle, if you don't have it in your mind that the pointy helmet is Germany, I mean, uh, you'll get quite a lot of that. And I guess over time here, you'll get the point. And just below Germany, of course, Austria-Hungary, which is where they are on the map as well. But the boiling point is one thing. But the crisis that erupts and the event that sparks World War One is uh is what we're working towards so what is austria hungary a lot of my students are like what the what the heck is austria hungary when when did they happen because we haven't really studied austria or hungary at all they are two kind of distinct different um locales but they are now united under one king who kind of sits on two thrones that is emperor franz joseph the first and the heir apparent to take his place when he dies and he is of ill health. I think he dies in 1916, so it's not uh, too far down the road. And most people understand that uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, his heir apparent, will rise to the throne and take over. These are two very different men. And I would say Emperor Franz Joseph is more of the, you know, military sort, militarism, which is something we discussed. Um, He is uh, never pictured without his military uniform on, with all those medals and everything. And Franz Joseph is pictured here with his uniform on as well, which is what they would do uh, in the day. But uh, he was much less interested in war, much more interested in how can I unify the people of this new empire and hear some of these different ethnic voices and minorities uh, to keep the peace. And he was less interested with expanding his territory. As you can see here, they have expanded in blue. The Austria-Hungarians have expanded down into Bosnia-Herzegovina to Serbia. Okay, you see where it says to Serbia. 
well, this used to be more of a Serbian territory, or they want it to be united, many Serbs do, as a Southern Slavic or Yugoslavic territory. Okay, So, Austria-Hungary. <clears throat> many modern-day nation-states are and, and have emerged from Austria-Hungary, this conglomerated empire. And if you look at the top right side, you see Austria, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Croatia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Italy, Montenegro, Poland, above that, above all this, um, Romania, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Ukraine. There are just a lot of different ethnic uh, groups here, and we're going to look at why that is. There are different languages, customs, traditions, and uh, cultures. Um, but this European civil war with a global reach is about to happen, and um, it's really, in many ways, uh, a, a series of civil wars within these different territories. This is definitely one of them. Austria-Hungary expanding, and the Serbs and others wanting to uh, have their independence. And we'll see this happen again in World War II. The same kind of thing is going to happen. Germany will take territory that, you know, same with Austria-Hungary. They kind of take Austria-Hungary as well and make a German state out of it. Many people like the Czechs um, and what becomes Czech Czechoslovakia. Uh, today it's two different things. And that's because it really is two different cultures. But there's this nationalism and the nationalist movement that threatens the power structures that are currently set up. Freedom movements like that in Serbia. Intense nationalist competition between countries. They gave statesmen little room for compromise and assured widespread popularity for starting a war because people were kind of feeling that. They were itching for war in many ways. And Slavic nationalism uh, added to this. The imperial nature of Europe added to this. And what we end up having is this war where all of the world comes to fight in Europe and in the Middle East and uh, sort of northern Africa there. We'll see some, some battles as well. But hundreds of thousands of people from Africa, India, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and places like South Africa would take part in the, in the struggle. And on the bottom right there, you see French uh, colonists uh, fighting probably from Indochina, which is like uh, Vietnam area today. So that's a, that was a, a colony of France. This is a better way to explain what we're dealing with here. The top map is a physical map of Austria-Hungary in 1914. I guess it would be the same today. I don't know that the land's changed dramatically. But the, bo the bottom map below that, if you almost like take in your mind and overlap these two together, you can see and sense where... The geography of the land, like here in the uh, uh, Hungarian plain, it creates a situation where these people feel as if they're Hungarian. That's their nationality. That's who they are. And up here in the more mountainous areas in the Alps um, are the Austrians, and they feel a sense of that. You get down here in this territory, which is part of Austria-Hungary, um, and they feel in Trent or Trento, I think that's how you say it in Italian, they feel Italian. And there is a, a great mixture of languages here. And in, in this territory, uh, minorities sought the wide, widest opportunities for education for their own language, as well as the dominant languages of the day, which is Austrian. Uh, and, and the Austrian Empire was German, which tells you something, too. The German Empire is right in that border. And in World War II, it'll be kind of combined. And Hitler's from Austria. But the Kingdom of Hungary... Um, most speak Hungarian, um, and some, up to 64%, speak some Hungarian. Uh, various ethnic groups sought anything from their own language taught in schools to outright independence. And this is really important to kind of consider when we're talking about um, race as maybe a reason for this war happening, you know, as a social construct. Um, it's not really maybe race that's the best word for it, but maybe nationalities or different groups. And seeing someone who speaks a different language and have different customs as being other, that is a strong undertone to everything that's happening here. Now this is the uh, Khan Academy's YouTube um, video on the Princip assassination, and they do a really good job of talking through this. Khan actually does. 
and uh, there is a ton of information out there now and really good nice videos uh, to explain this in much the same way I'm doing but maybe not with as many uh, pictures and maybe not as tied to the AP test and as tied to Strayer this is a great really nice way of looking at this and for the test I want you to know the triple entente and I want you to know the triple alliance these are the two the purple and the green that you must know and must know the name and the three countries that make up both because this is the beginning of the war certainly they change over time but I want you to kinda of attach that World War One these two alliances as the triple entente and the triple uh, alliance some students don't really get it but the blue part here is the alliance okay so you see at the bottom it says alliance and the dates are when those alliances kind of attached. In 1914 is the Ottoman Empire, which doesn't come into this for, for quite some time. Bulgaria is supported and aided by Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, Serbia supported by Russia. And the Russians feel as if the Serbians are sort of like their little brothers in, in a way. They're protector of Serbia. Um, France and Great Britain signed their treaties as well. And we've talked a little bit about that in the last uh, section of notes. And so these two alliances are one of the reasons that war will occur. Militarism was another one. And the huge increase in the size of European armies increases the tension. Because as you see your neighbor building railways toward your territory, and as you see your neighbor um, training troops uh, in large, large numbers, you start to worry. And don't think that these places are in a vacuum. In fact, many of the, uh, the leaders, the... Uh, kings and queens and princes and archdukes there was so much like inter intermarrying in in that sense like we saw with louis and uh Mar marie and france it was the same kind of thing so european armies double in size russia has 1.3 million troops here and soldiers at the beginning of the war in 1914 they have the most people so they have the potential to have the biggest armies um, France and Germany about uh, just under a million apiece. Britain, Italy, and Austria-Hungary about 300,000. And you can see at the bottom sort of that feel as people are going to war and they're kind of raising up their hand like, hey, we'll see ya. We'll be back here soon. It's not going to take too long. We're, we're heading out to Paris. It'll be a nice trip. We'll be back. So we call this event the spark that lights the powder keg. And I'll discuss that a little bit more, but the powder keg is down there on the bottom with the Serbian colors and flag on it there. And at the very top, you see the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, his children, and his wife, Sophia. The Archduke was not to marry this woman, and it was sort of like a, a, a big disagreement within the royal family. He married uh, Sophie, or Sophia, because he loved her. He really wanted to spend his life with her. And in many ways, they were a, a true partnership. And sadly, Archduke Franz Ferdinand might have been a really uh, a pretty good ruler based upon the notes and things and diaries and, and such that he has written and uh, from what people have, have said. But we know the story, and we've seen a little video cl clip in class about this, but Gavril Princip... Um, uh, Serbian terrorist who wanted Bosnia to become independent from Austria-Hungary assassinates and kills the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Unfortunately, his gun also hits Sophia in the stomach, which kills her. They both die on the way to hospital. And unfortunately, she was pregnant with a child at the time, too. So this is a, uh, a major tragedy, but as Neil Ferguson says in the... In the um, the video that we'll watch in class or did watch in class, he mentions that, you know, assassinations are ten a penny in uh, nationalist Europe, and these sort of terrorist acts are, are happening. So what makes this one so different and compelling that creates World War I or helps to spark it? You see the, uh, the car moments before the assassination. We've talked in class about how the car takes the wrong turn. You know, and they back up as they realize they've gone the wrong direction. The car engine stalls. It's just not like the, the cars we have today. These are uh, very new inventions, and they're not working so great. And uh, so Princip has this perfect opportunity to shoot and kill um, the Archduke. Uh, just moments before that, he thought this whole thing had blown up in their face, and literally it did. They'd thrown a bomb at the car. It bounces off the car, and and goes off in the crowd people are injured they're taken to the hospital but nothing happens to uh the archduke in his in his motorcade 
the Archduke, the good guy that he is, goes to the hospital to meet with the injured people to show them, you know, his support and, and deliver his words of encouragement for them to heal. And, of course, that puts them on this pace to drive back through. And that's where Princip is sitting in a cafe having a, a, a sandwich, probably feeling pretty dejected and down. And all of a sudden here, he looks up and the guy he wanted to assassinate is right before him and he has a gun in his hand. So history happens. Princip is only 19 years old. They put him on trial pretty quickly and find that he and many of the others are guilty. And it's not the death penalty for Princip because he's only 19. So he is put into uh, prison. And you see Terezin, the fortress. This is later a concentration camp in World War II. Uh, he is held in very harsh conditions. He dies in prison just a few years later at age 23 of tuberculosis. Uh, in some ways, it was the death penalty in, in that regard. This was a major event, but not one that you would consider to be uh, big enough and important enough to cause a war, a world war, certainly. So here's the blood-soaked uniform of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. You can see where it's been cut, almost like they tried to uh, get in there to, to get to the wound and put pressure on it. Um, all of those buttons on that military jacket, of course, probably not the best idea. Looking back at the situation here, awfully difficult to get to it and, and, and to get him some help when the bullets pierced that. So that's pre-war Europe, 1914, and things are going to change very, very dramatically. And you can just see here, how much territory does the German Empire have stretching all the way to Russia? And how much territory does Austria-Hungary have as they're stretching south into the Balkans? So the assassination is the spark that lights the powder keg. We have talked before about militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. Those four things and the spark is what uh, sets the powder keg off and the explosion of World War I. And ironically, as I kind of mentioned earlier, the Archduke is not interested in war. He wanted to improve relations with the ethnic groups when he came to power. A quote that he said was, uh, I need them to be with me, not against me. In fact, many Serbians are very upset that he is killed because they look at this is a chance to work with the Archduke when he becomes, with Franz Ferdinand, when he becomes the emperor, to potentially have a more unified Yugoslavia that they want so badly. And so it's not like all of Serbia wants to go to war with uh, Austria-Hungary. But unfortunately, <clears throat> Austria-Hungary... Uh, feels and they use the king or sorry the, the the potential emperor here in his death as a reason to go to war so it's quite ironic that here's the archduke who was pretty much wanting to seek peaceful ways and then now his death causes the world's biggest war to this point so here are the alliances again one more time and really want to focus on Know the Triple Alliance and know the Triple Entente. And I know it gets confusing because the Triple Alliance becomes the Central Powers. I know. And later they'll become something different in World War II. And the Triple Entente, I know. They're called the Allies. So that seems similar to Alliance. And so we get these confused. Just don't get them confused. Just learn them. Russia, France, and Great Britain are sort of the bread on the sandwich here. Okay, if you look at it that way, it looks like two pieces of bread. They have surrounded Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. The Balkans are in red there. So that's that territory that's really an uncertain mix. The powder keg, as we've mentioned. And the Ottoman Empire below them. Now, Italy will drop out of the war pretty quickly. The Ottoman Empire will come into it on the side of the central power. So keep that in mind as we go forward. But know these two alliances for the test. So, what is the point of view get it see it's a pretty good one you almost should pause the video here and think about who's pointing to who what's the point of view of england and belgium france italy serbia austria germany and russia as war is occurring who do they blame and what uh what happens here after this the peace of europe lies dead at the top and there's an accusing finger pointing down it's probably the rest of the world saying you know who did this the Serbian campaign, uh, Austria invades Serbia in August 12th, on August 12th of 1914. It's kind of funny. They send them a nice telegram to explain, hey, here comes war. 
Uh, I guess they didn't have email just yet, um, but the the telegram is kind of interesting to look at. But the Serbian army rallied to pre early success, and but ultimately fails in this in the beginning of the war. They they are no match for what Austria Hungary has initially, and they're also aided by uh, Bulgaria uh, as well. Don't to keep that in mind also. But the Kingdom of Serbia loses one million inhabitants during the war. These are both army and, and civilian losses. 27% of the entire population is killed and 65% of all males. There are incredible uh, uh, periods of hunger and disease. And you can see the, the political poster at the bottom there that says, Save Serbia, our ally. And it says, send contributions to the Serbian Relief Committee of America. And at the bottom, you see the Entente Powers percentage of, de of people who die in the war. Serbia at 8% is certainly bigger than you would expect, being such a small territory. There are brutal atrocities committed against the Serbian people. Um, the Serbian Revolution, this is a little background because I just want you to understand where we're coming here. And, and after World War I and even World War II, there's still difficulties there in Serbia and the Balkans. And today, as we, as we speak, just um, east of, the, of here, the Ukraine is, is struggling. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, this is just not an easy territory. And, I, and mostly it's because of the, the, the mountainous terrain and the territory, the geography of this place, and the many different ethnic groups that make up these countries. And they're very small in terms of who they are. If you unite them, and sometimes people want to do that to make a more powerful presence in the world, it can create some real issues. You can read this on your own to get some background to it, but summarizing it, uh, Serbia wins the first major battles of World War I, but they're eventually overpowered. In the end, they do. A Serbian force is pulled together uh, and fights with the Allies, the original Central, or I'm sorry, the original um, Triple Entente, to defeat Austria Hungary in World War I in the southern part of the war. But uh, Serbia um, becomes part of Yugos a Yugoslav nation after the war, and they do this again, a second Yugoslavia after World War II. Today, these countries are split apart, and in the 1990s, the Bosnian genocide was this ethnic cleansing that occurred on behalf of the Serbians against the people of Bosnia, which is the place where this... Um, this assassination occurs. Serbia is about the size of Indiana, to give you a little bit of a, an understanding of that. Um, many people, like in the New York Times, said Serbia ceases to exist. I mean, basically wiped off the face of the earth by the Austria-Hungarian Empire. And you see the many atrocities kind of pictured here. The top picture is Serbs will smash you to pieces. This is racial hatred and really what results in a, a, a genocide of, of sorts with war. And the Serbian army retreating there to Albania, which is to uh, the east. Um, and then on the right side, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Empire, or sorry, their soldiers, who are executing Serb civilians. These aren't even soldiers. At the bottom, the, the many remains of those massacred by Bulgarian soldiers. So this system of extermination is something to keep in mind. This is definitely a race, racial war, racial undertones. The outbreak of war, it uh, flows pretty quickly from here. Once this, this fighting starts, Russia responds by supporting Serbia publicly. And the Tsar, pictured to the right there, orders a partial and then full mobilization of the Russian army. And Austria, Hungary, and Germany considered this mobilization an act of war. Mobilization means you're getting your soldiers ready, you're transporting them to the border, it's a show of aggression, so they take it personally. You see the Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany there below. And you also see his shortened arm. His left arm is very short, very weak and small. And he'd often shake people's hands with a really super strong grip of a right hand. He was a, an interesting person and also related to and uh, shared a common family history with many of these other emperors um, in Russia, in uh, England and Europe, across Europe. So the conflict broadens and it starts here. Germany declares war on Russia on August 1st, 1914. And, and General Alfred von Schlieffen, which we'll have some fun with this in class, 
it looks almost as if he is a little bit schleef in there or sleeping. He looks tired and he just has kind of a heavy eyelid effect there. His plan is to create not just a two front war, but to quickly create a two front war and end the war quickly on the Western front, which becomes the Western front. It's decent plans. Good plan doesn't work. They want to swing through and you can look at the map here, swing through uh, into France, take Paris quickly, and they know that Paris is going to be defending this border here, their border with Germany. It only makes sense. That's where Germany would enter, right? This is Belgium, where the B is. And the Allies do not, the, the central, oh, sorry, the Triple Entente, which become the Allies, they do not expect Germany to invade in that direction. So, Germany makes this vast encircling movement down there into uh, neutral Belgium and then into France. Many atrocities committed against the Belgian people. They do a really good job of explaining that and talking through it in uh, the First World War, which is a documentary I have a link to on the webpage, and, and it's on YouTube. It is the documentary to watch if you want to really know the details of all of this. But the Germans are halted at a short distance from Paris at the First Battle of the Marne. This is the French miracle at the Marne. And if it's not for this, um, it could be very possible that French culture, language, and uh, the, the ways of uh, you know the, the France today and Paris today could be German. They could be speaking German in, in some ways because this is very close to becoming a continental Europe that is mostly German or of German uh, control. Great Britain jumps into the war and it helps to defend as well and they're sending um, troops across the Strait of Dover there. Uh, the Belgian people are just crushed by this encroachment by Germany. Um, they are eager for war. They're shooting what they call frontiers. Those frontier people or people in the rural areas they see people out and about and the german army are picking them off as they go and it's it, it's pretty brutal in some ways and a very pretty quick advance you see the rivers here and these are going to play a big part in the war um, the marne river is right here in the middle and you can see paris sits here off in the distance where the Marne is and where Paris is is not that far away. And uh, the stopping this advance here was a, a serious thing. All of these troops that are here on the border defending Germany, they've got to kind of swing back to the Marne to make this first stand. These are the French soldiers um, waiting the assault behind a ditch, not yet a trench. Um, you see the horses and buggy as they're pulling um, people and supplies to the front. And this is the first time that planes are used for reconnaissance uh, techniques to look down and see where the Germans are and as they're advancing. They're not yet dropping bombs or doing anything like that because these planes are early creations that they're sort of like cardboard boxes with a lawnmower engine in it and they're lucky to get it off the ground and to land it. And the casualty rates and survival rates people are... are pretty atrocious with planes in the beginning part of this war. 600 Parisian taxi cabs transport 6,000 French reserve troops to the battle and that's interesting too. This is sort of all hands on deck for France and they've got to make their stand here at the first battle of the Marne and ironically it's the sixth army of the Germans who we'll see again next chapter. It's probably their best army who are trying to break through and the arrival has traditionally been described as cri as critical in stopping a possible German breakthrough against that 6th Army. So um, we'll see at the end of the war one of the last major battles of the spring offensive for the Germans four years later is fought here at the Second Battle of the Marne and probably an, an instrumental reason that uh, Germany ends up um, losing this war. As you see here, the picture of modern warfare which of these pictures looks like trench warfare to you? Uh, the picture at the top left looks more like the Boy Scouts, you know, and the look on the face of the British soldier at the bottom left is one, and this is a recreated image in a movie, 
but you get the sense for of, of what must have been going through their minds. Uh, this is going to be difficult, Trent, the trench war, and we'll look much more at it here in the next section of notes. Um, people were eager to go to war, even in Britain and in uh, France. And Neil Ferguson argues, why does the British Empire decide to go to war here? Why not just let Germany take the continent? What's the difference? Now, they think the Germans are quite cultured anyway. I mean, they have some respect for them. And these are people who um, have a highly educated culture, just like they do. Uh, Great Britain doesn't have any territory or really want any territory on the mainland of Europe. But I think the concern is a powerful Germany would would uh, compete with them across the world uh, in terms of empire and, and, and keeping... They want to keep things the way they are, the status quo. They want to... It, this is a, a movement to go to war where... Sure, they're protecting Belgium and their ally France and Russia, but they also don't want to give up any power and control to uh, a rising power, which is Germany. Of the two, Austria-Hungary and Germany, Germany is much more uh, powerful, and you'll see that. Uh, one of the posters I want to focus on here is the one at the bottom middle. Britain's, um, he wants you, and that is Lord Kitchener, the man who is running the army, he uh, famously uh, makes his name in the Boer War, which happens in South uh, South uh, Africa. But that poster is is exactly what the Americans end up using with Uncle Sam pointing. Um, it's it's pretty much copied with just a different uh, a different person. Um, All Quiet on the Western Front. This is a clip from the 1979 movie. There was a remake, and of course they're trying to do another remake. Um, every year I say that it's going to be out this year, and it doesn't seem to get done. But the latest that I've seen is 2014, and it looks like Harry Potter will play um, uh, the main character in Remark's story called All Quiet on the Western Front. A couple uh, images here that we'll look at in class. This is a German hospital for wounded sur soldiers. Uh, the thing that's crazy here is that they're lighting candles on this tree and it's next to a bottle of alcohol. It just seems like kind of a bad idea. But that does end up giving us our current Christmas trees with, and they're a little safer today, I guess. So um, This is uh, in England and these are English soldiers, British soldiers who have been uh, severely injured in battle. This man doesn't even have a right leg. And um, they're playing cricket. Um, no, not cricket, like cro cro crochet, I guess it is, with the mallet and the balls. I can't remember what that's called, but they're playing a game and getting outdoors. Some of them even with smiles on their faces, but I'm sure this has got to be a very difficult uh, time period. And, of course, this is coffins of excavated bodies of English prisoners of war being prepared for transportation back to England, and this is in Germany in 1923, so... We're talking about years later after the war is over. It ends in, in 1919. So uh, the making of modern Britain, the Great War. This is um, Andrew Marr. My, my feel on this is watch the documentary. We'll see parts of it in class, but to me, watch the documentary. This is compelling, gripping stuff, um, similar to how he made and created uh, the series we've been watching, The History of the World. But I think this is a, a great video to watch to get some flavor and understand. We'll see a couple of different scenes in class. So that's part two of the notes here for chapter 21, part one, World War One. And as I flip back here to the beginning, keep in mind things to know and really focus on are, um, first of all, who are the two alliances? And also, what are the main reasons for war? And we've talked about those. Militarism, right? Uh, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, and you could throw a fifth thing and factor in there. It's this uh, feeling of racial uh, or uh, superiority compared to the other. We've seen that across the world with social Darwinism, and now it's really taking place in Europe where people are um, singling out territory, and we, we've seen as we look through these notes this idea of racial uh, purification or extermination of the other. We'll see more of that, unfortunately. Uh, next time we'll look in part three at what it was like to fight in the trenches during World War One. We'll see you next time. And um, let's see, what am I supposed to say here?
Oh yeah, don't forget to be awesome.